eyes and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Uh, James chapter 4, and I've got Mark, we're ready for verse 9. Is that what anybody else has got? Eight. I've got 15. 15. Yeah, that's right. What? <laughs> okay, you know, I thought, I thought it looked like I had taught starting with verse 8 or verse 9 last week. Uh, and you say you got, somebody's got 15? Okay. Okay, now let me just kind of recap here a minute before I get into 15. Uh, James is just, he's just ordinary things that we need to do, uh, that he tells us we need to do to uh, be the kind of people that God wants us to be. I can remember when I first became a Christian, I thought, I wish God had just given us a bunch of lists and said, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. But you know, now that I've studied, he did. He did. That's what this is all about. If you just look at it and don't take things out of context, keep the subject where it should be. Uh, it's like, I mean, like so many people, uh, uh, even with the plan of salvation, they'll read one thing that has to do with the plan of salvation and they don't consider the rest of it. Uh, the Bible is a book that needs to be considered in its entirety. Uh, it does, you don't just take it and uh, get your one idea out of it. Uh, you, have to, you have to take it all. Uh, so he's, he, he told them, and here in James, let's just take James for instance. Here in James, chapter 1, uh, or chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, uh, he's really on them about... Uh, this warring spirit that they had, uh, you know, this backbiting, and, and he uses war. I don't think he's really saying they were warring or killing each other. He's using that figurative to tell them, uh, hyperbole, uh, to tell them uh, how bad what they were doing was and basically what it could lead to, that uh, there's no place for this bickering and fussing and fighting and running down your brother or actually running down anybody because we're all made in God's image. But I, and when I was studying today, I don't know how I missed this before, but I did. Uh, he was talking about why, and, and we, we should consider this too, especially us, those of us that are older Christians, when new Christians come into the church, we need to, we need to consider uh, where they've been, uh, what, what kind of baggage they're bringing with them. Uh, con consider the family they grew up in, the place they grew up in, and be extra tolerant. That is so hard for us in the church sometimes to be so tolerant because we know we've got the truth. And we get, we get so tired of everybody shooting at us all the time. Uh, and sometimes we take the wrong attitude. We take a warring attitude like these people did, and you can't do that. But with these people, these Jews had become Christians. And some others had become, but mostly Jews here had become Christians. Some of them came out of the Pharisees. Some of them came out of the Sadducees. Some of them came out of the Herodians. Some of them uh, came out of the Zealots. And there was one other main group. Anybody think of that? But anyway, there was another main group. Of course, there were bound to have been other offshoot groups too. And when they came into there, they came in with so much baggage. Uh, they were, you know how the Pharisees and the Sadducees, how nasty they were and they were at each other. Uh, the Zealots... The, the zealots were a, they were actually a warring group. I mean, they, they were going to get you. And, and the Hellenists, uh, they, were, they were people that followed the Greeks so close. And they had a mess. They had, and you don't, the minute you come up out of that baptistry, you don't change. What happens in the baptistry, you receive 
the gift of the Holy Spirit, when your sins are washed away in the, in the waters of baptism, you, because that's where you contact the blood of Jesus, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't just poke a magic wand at you or rub a lamp or something, and you're perfect. You're not going to be perfect until you get to heaven. That's when our perfection will come. But we need to be working on it. But, you know, we get, we get people... Have I, have I insulted you yet today, Bonnie? No. I'm just about to. Uh, but, we, well, you, Bonnie, you wouldn't be able to... You'd call me tonight and you'd say, Tom, would you please ex insult me so I can go to sleep? <laughs> Or you'd call and say, I'm sending Vernon over. You better watch your mouth. <laughs> you know what it's like. Uh, we've got all kinds of things going on in our lives. And James was trying to teach them, and with the Scripture, do what he should be doing, show them what was right and what was wrong. In the first ten verses of chapter 4, he's telling them all of these warring tongue problems they had and all this that was going on now. Then, then what he's doing, in starting in verse 11, he does the thing that is so great for us, and maybe we just don't realize this. He's telling us how to correct it. That's what I like. I like if somebody's going to tell me what's wrong with me, Tell me what to do to make it right. That's what I want to hear. In fact, I hope in your prayers you say, God, I want to be the kind of person I want to be, and then say, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. That's the kind of servant that is pleasing to God. And then look and see what he's doing. Read the Scripture and find out whether your life measures up or not. One of the questions he asks here in, uh, look in verse 14 a minute. He says, whereas ye know not sh what shall be on the morrow, or you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Then he says, for what is your life? What is your life? In the Greek, that actually says, what is the character of your life? Or what kind of a person are you? What does James want them to do? He says, this is the way you have been. Look at yourself. You know what I'm telling you is true. Now listen to what I've got to tell you. And see how your life measures up. Uh, my... If somebody comes to you and they come to you in all humility and, and love and, and they, they want to help you, there's something wrong in your life. Uh, do, do, you, do you know, they say, that? do you know you have this problem? I, I'll never forget. Her name was Essie Stansfield. She lived over by Manchester. She was a member of the Moores Hill Church. Uh, Bill Reed called Essie Stanfield and a Mrs. Stone King, I think her name was, when I was baptized. He wanted to have a couple of witnesses when, when I was baptized. Uh, and I can remember Elsie called me after we were baptized. She said, I want to give you a hint. I want to help you some. Because I kept calling Brother Bill Reverend Reed, Reverend Reed, Reverend Reed. And she said, Tom, the Bible does not use that for him. Reverend should be res reserved for God. In fact, when the Bible talks about reverend, he, he says holy and reverend is God's name. And I certainly don't. And I've had people tell me, Tom, you need to go ahead and call yourself reverend because you deserve it. I don't deserve anything that God's got. Uh, I wouldn't dare to presume that. But I always appreciated that. And you know, I, I really think that that helped me to begin to look at the Scripture and say, what does the Scripture really say? 
But so many times we don't do that. We hear all this junk on television. We, we have friends, denominational friends, and sometimes Church of Christ friends that they tell us this and they tell us that. And then we add a little bit to it. Let's be studiers ourselves. Let's see what the Bible really says, and then we're going to be okay. And then we're going to be able to help people. Uh, okay, uh, so now what he's doing in James, and I didn't tell you this last week, I don't think, but what he's doing in James, he's saying, now I've told you about all these problems. Here's why you have these problems. And we've talked about it before. When he's telling them how to straighten something out, why do you suppose he's telling them they need something to straighten something out? Because they got something wrong. He's saying, here's what you do to straighten it out, because this is what's wrong in your life. He wasn't just taking a shotgun and, and making a blast and hoping to hit everything that they might have in their life. He knew what was going on, and he's preaching about it. Okay, uh, 15. He says, For that ye ought to say, or he's saying, instead of saying, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to go here, and we're going to go there, and this is when we're going to go, this is what we're going to do when we get there. He's saying to them, and what, he, what he's trying to tell them is, you aren't including God in your life. Uh, everything, everything that we do, I think we need to pray about. Uh, now, a lot of people use this scripture. They would, when I say you need to pray about everything, their proof of that would be where he says, I think it's in Thessalonians, where he says, pray without ceasing. He's, he's not telling them to pray all the time, okay? Now, I do believe we need to be in an attitude of prayer all the time. That's just a spiritual attitude. But what he's saying to them is, even though things look bad, even though it seems like God is not answering, like God doesn't know about your problems, he's saying, continue to pray. That means continue to have faith in God and continue to ask him to take care of it because, listen, he sent Jesus to die for us so we know he loves us. There is no doubt in our mind, or there shouldn't be, that our God loves us and cares for us and wants the best for us. So uh, he's saying keep on praying. Keep, even though your answer has not come yet, just keep on praying. My, I've prayed for people to become Christians for decades. A bunch of them didn't, but a bunch of them did. And some of those were family members, and that was so, so sweet. God will answer in his own time. We don't want God to answer when the time is not right, because that might throw a monkey wrench into everything else God is doing. We don't know what he's doing. Uh, we might surmise that we do, but uh, we, know, we know many things that he will do. And we know many things that he is doing, but we don't know God's plans. And these people were here in James, they were acting like they did know his plans. Now, I started something, and I didn't, it, it, was I trying to make a point on something that I didn't make? You don't know? Okay, then I don't care if I didn't make it or not, if you don't even know. <laughs> Bonnie, I about insulted you again. But I, I'll get it out, Bonnie, before it's, sure. before it's over. Okay. I hated to put off that eye surgery. Whew. This is terrible. I, I guess I could. What is it you ought to say? Or instead of saying these things that they were saying and leaving God out of everything... Uh, he says, he's saying, here's what you ought to say. Uh, if the Lord will, or if it's what God wants, if it's what God wants, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Do you really want 
a prayer answered. Do you really want a prayer answered that shouldn't be answered in the affirmative? Uh, <laughs> you didn't know me when I was in school, did you? Okay. You knew my brother. Well, now, he wasn't near as bad as I was. Uh, no, I should have said that the other way. I wasn't near as bad as he was. No, I was bad. Uh, I had a lot of girlfriends. And I don't ever remember any of them. Let me say this right. I don't ever remember breaking up with any of them. They always broke up with me. See, it was, it was me doing the wrong things. But I was always praying then when they would break up with me. Oh, God, give me this one back. Oh, God, take care of this. Take care of that. And you know, I meant it then. I wasn't even a Christian then. I should have kept my mouth shut because I was just wasting my breath asking God to do this and do that. But uh, when I look back now, there were some of those girls that I'm sure glad God didn't answer that prayer. Who was that that sang that country western song? Praise God for unanswered prayer. Who? Garth Brooks. Uh, boy, when I hear him sing that, I think, man, he's been where I've been. He knows what he's talking about. And in some other things, too. Uh, I wonder how many people have prayed for their children to be actors or actresses or uh, sports stars. And then they take a look at what's happened to so many of those people. Do you ever hear about a Hollywood celebrity dying of natural causes? Not unless they're an actor from out of my era. But today, and most of them out of my era not. They were in so much trouble. They, their lives were so loose. So sometimes uh, we better be careful what we pray. And that's what he's telling these people. Include God in your prayers. Or God, um, if you would have me to go to Jerusalem to do this, then God, that's what I want to do. God, if you would have me to have this kind of a business. Uh, God knows if those things are going to be things that will sell. Uh, things that people need instead of you just starting a business because you want one. We see that happen all over today. And you can say, well, give them six months and they won't be there. I wonder if they prayed about it. God, what he's saying here to these people, he's saying you are not including God in your prayers. And that's why I say pray about everything. Some, I, I can remember a sermon one time where somebody said, we have no business praying about anything, and he said something like that is, unless it's directly affected to the kingdom. He was trying to say, we don't pray about these everyday picayune things that come in our, in our life. I think we do. I mean, he calls himself our father. Don't we think he cares about the picayune things? Uh, Mary, look that up in the dictionary when we get home, would you? Uh, I got so many words that she tells me those aren't even words. Uh, now, how, how can somebody from Ohio County tell somebody from Dearborn County how to talk? I mean, oh, Dorothy's from Ohio County, too. Whew. Bonnie's not. Bonnie's on my side. Yeah. Okay, he says, include God is what he's saying to them. Uh, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this. Or that. And then notice, remember what he just said up in verse 14. He said, You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. My father was cutting the grass. He had been to Florida for the winter, part of the winter. Uh, he came home. He had worked on his lawnmower, got it all ready to cut the grass, feeling great had just come, and this is dangerous, he had just come back from the doctor about his heart, clean bill of health. My brother and his friend were working on the hydraulics on my brother's tractor, and Dad spoke to him as he walked by. They looked up. Dad was laying dead on the ground. That quick, that's what he's saying. He's saying, how dare you? 
How dare you be so ignorant as to leave God out of your lives? You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen in the next breath. I remember a man when I was a, a member at the Elizabeth City Church of Christ in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Uh, Homer Steins, one of, I guess probably one of my favorite preachers of that time. Uh, Homer Steins, I think, told the story of a man who lived in town. And Homer, uh, I believe, Homer had converted a lot of this man's family. And this man would not come to Jesus. He would not become a Christian. Well, finally, the man tells Homer, he said, this Sunday I'm going to become a Christian. Now, it's dangerous to pick you out of time. You become a Christian when you decide to become it. Don't say, well, I want to wait. And I have Mama here for my baptism and my cousins and everybody. No, don't do that. Don't do that. You're not trying to please them. You're trying to please your God. Without that baptism, you don't stand a chance. Because God says to do it, you don't want to disobey God. But I remember this guy. He had turned Homer down for years. Before Sunday, I think, in fact, it was, might have even been on a, an early Sunday morning or late Saturday night, Homer gets a telephone call. The man had had a heart attack and died. That close. Now I know people that are listening to me with this, oh, well, God would understand. You know, I'm not going to take a chance. When he tells me what to do, that's what I'm going to do. Like James says here, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Now, not only with your prayers, not only with your salvation, but with everything. With everything. Pray about it. Look through the scripture, and when you believe you've got an answer from God, go ahead and do it. But don't leave him out. I mean, don't make some kind of decision that God wouldn't be included in, and you can't even find in his word where he would. Know his word. If you, you know, people say, well, I, I don't know what God wants me to do. You know why you don't know what God wants you to do? Because you don't know his word. You don't know God. Now, I'm not going to say by knowing his word and knowing God, you're going to look into scripture and, and thou shalt not do this, thou shalt, you're going to jump off the page. No, but when you know the characteristics, when you know the attitude of God, it sure helps you in what you're going to do. Uh, you know, would God do this? Or should I lay off of this? I mean, that's not something my God would do. Don't do it. Don't do it. But these people weren't doing that. These people were just rushing to judgment. They were doing whatever they wanted to do. They were leaving their God out of everything. They basically were living the way they lived when they were Jews and not Christians. They were just doing what they wanted to do. And what they were doing, they were becoming a God themselves. We're going to see some more of that here in just a minute, I believe. Uh, for you ought to say what the, you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Verse 16. Now ye rejoice in your boastings. Or instead of saying, if the Lord will, you're doing these wrong things. You haven't gotten God's okay. You haven't shared this with God. You're not including God in this, and you're bragging about it. Well, we did this ourselves. That's kind of what Nadab and Abihu did, wasn't it? Well, we did this ourselves. God said not to use strange fire, and we did anyway. And God zapped them. God burned them up on the spot. Don't, don't get burned up. It might not be on the spot, but it'll, it will be burned up. No, it won't be burned up. It'll be burned, because you won't be burned up. You'll be burned. You'll continue. Uh, Okay, uh, but now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. 
you've left God out of your plans, it's evident that what you're going to do or what you have done is not scriptural. What does he say? He said it's evil. He doesn't just say it's a sin, but he says it's evil. I'd rather somebody tell me I'm a sinner than tell me I'm evil. I don't know that there's a great, a great big difference in the two, but one sure sounds a whole lot worse than the other. He says, this is evil. Now, I think one thing that James had going for himself here, these were new Christians, and they were moldable. But you know, if, if this is why we need to know the Word. Uh, this is why the older Christians here need to be those that are stepping out and really explaining to others and let them grow so someday they can be reaching out uh, because so somebody needs to be doing the teaching about these things. Uh, but now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. And that word there probably that would help us a little more than rejoicing is actually glorying. You're glorying in this. Uh, they were bragging about it. They were, man, aren't we something? We've done this. Uh, I think I used this once before. Uh, Little House on the Prairie. Uh, does everybody remember that? I'm sure we're all old enough to remember that. Jonathan Ingalls was the daddy's name, wasn't he? He had been out, I can, I can still see him. He had on his work pants, his shirt was off, he had on those big wide farmer suspenders, and uh, he had come in the house, had worked all day long in the hot, plowing and plowing and plowing, and I'm sure their plowing wasn't near as easy as ours is, but uh, here's his sweet wife, what was her name? Carolyn. Carolyn, here's Carolyn. Uh, he has the prayer for supper. He's so tired he can't hardly hold his head up. He has the prayer for su supper, and he thanks. In, in the prayer, he said, God, I thank you. Uh, something about, talking about how he, not God, how Charles got all that work done. And when he got done, she said, Charles, don't you think you should give God credit for that? And he said, God didn't do the work I did. This is kind of the attitude that these kind of people had. They, God didn't do it. I mean, if you're not going to include God in it, you're the one going to take credit for it. Now, that, that's just not the way it should be. And a, a lot of people, I'm sure, say, well, God is so narrow-minded. Yes, he is, and I'm glad he is. Same yesterday, today, and forever more. I can depend upon what God says, and I know he loves me. So I know what he says is right, and it's right all the time. Let's include him in everything that we do. I, I can remember when I became a Christian, Bill Reed was the preacher. Bill's the one that converted me. I was in Bill's office with him one time. We were working with a man who we had baptized probably just a couple of weeks before that. And the man was, he had been a heavy drinker, still was, heavy smoker. And he had repented. That was supposed, he was supposed to be working on those things to get him out of his, out of his life. And he said, I just can't throw those cigarettes away. Bill said, Carl, every time you go to put a cigarette in your mouth, thank God, just like you would for your food. Thank God for that cigarette. Oh, he said, no, I couldn't do that. And they said, then don't smoke them. Don't smoke them. Whatever we're going to be doing, if you can't thank God, for what you're going to do, then don't do it. Don't do it. If what you're going to do is going to upset somebody and it would be wrong for you to upset them, 
and it usually is, don't do it. Let's get self out of the picture. Okay, verse 17. Therefore, therefore to him that knoweth to do good, what's he just taught them? He's taught them that they needed to be doing good. We seem to have the idea in our Christian lives sometimes, as long as I don't do bad things, as long as I don't steal, as long as I don't cheat, as long as I don't use bad language, as long as I, the list would be a mile long. I'm okay. And so what we do, and this is a big mistake, it's never a mistake to get the sins out of your life. But there are people who work, do nothing but work on getting the wrong out of their life. This is salvation, to, to, or being a Christian is a two-way street. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't just be interested in getting the wrong out of your life what else should you be interested in? Doing what's right. See, that's, that's where our Christian witness, we get the wrong out, and then when people see that we really did get that out, and we mean business, now we're really serving the Lord and doing the things that he tells us to do that are good. We, were, we have come into Christ to do what? To do good works. That's our job. Now, sometimes that's telling other people about Jesus, but we've come into him to do good works. He has, he has put these works, the scripture tells us, he's put these works out there for us to do. Let's find them. Let's find them. Uh, instead, of, instead of trying to see how we can stay away from helping people, Shouldn't we as Christians be trying to find ways to make their life better for them? To show them what Christianity is all about? What does he say? I think we've already studied it here in James. If somebody needs something, don't just say, go, your, go brother and go your way and, and, and I'll pray for you. Praying is not enough. Praying is not enough. If you can do something to help that person alleviate that problem, then you need to help them. Notice what he says here. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, or you know what's right, and you don't do it, what does he say? To him, it is sin. If I know there's something good out there to do, and I don't do it, then that becomes sin to me. There are a lot of sins that we could term, thou shalt not do this. But then we need to realize there are a whole lot of things in the Bible that can become sin because he says, you shall do this, and you don't. So it becomes a sin. We need to be careful. In fact, Repentance. I've always used the illustration. Uh, well, uh, let me, I've used, I think I'd used a right illustration, but probably did not understand this when I first became a Christian. Usually we think of repentance, of seeing that something is wrong in our life and we stop doing it. Is that repentance? Halfway. You're halfway. True repentance is having something wrong in your life, getting rid of it, and doing something right. You've stopped being the kind of person that does wrong things, and this is exactly what this verse is talking about, and you've started being the kind of person that does right things. Maybe, maybe you were a person that and, and I tell you, this is one way to really measure your Christianity. How much trouble do you have with other people? I mean, is it a constant, just 
aggravation with other people or they're aggravated with you. Somebody's always upset with you. They shouldn't be. If that's the case, you're doing something wrong. I don't care if you go, say, go to the scripture and you say, if we, if we preach the gospel, we're going to have persecution. That's right. But you're not always going to have it. That's because we, we don't need to be the kind of Christians that are in somebody's face all the time. Showing them how much we know. What is it he says in first, what is it? Is it first Peter 3.15? Uh, be ready always to give an answer to anyone that asks. Uh, and he's talking about, about your faith. Then what does he say? With meekness and fear. But we don't usually do that. We're going to let them know. We're, we're going to get our two cents worth in. You're not going to win anybody like that. That's like coming and knocking on my door and I answer the door and you spit in my face and you say, now can I come in and talk to you about Jesus? Well, of course not. It's not going to happen. James is trying to straighten so much of that out. He's given them this list on how not to behave. For him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Okay. Uh, any questions? Any comments? Any good illustrations that I should have used and didn't? <laughs> now I tell you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you tonight. I was prepared tonight to teach from verse 9 through verse 17. And then I come in here, and Tanya's smart aleck enough to tell me that we're supposed to start in verse 15. So, I haven't been, hope I haven't been wasting your time. But we're going to see now how ready I am for a verse I haven't studied. Let's look at, let's look at chapter 5. He says... Go to now, or listen to me, go to now, we've had that before. Go to now, ye rich men. And I suppose he was talking to some rich men. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Well, I know a lot of people that have had a lot of miseries come upon them. Uh, you remember Carl Rovotic probably from Falls Mills. Carl and his wife Natalie. Carl's dead now. Natalie's alive. And, and I'm just going to guess and say Carl and Nat Natalie probably were over millionaires. Always had a good job. He, he started out playing baseball for the uh, Atlanta Braves. That tells you how long ago that was. And uh, Went to college, and I think he got an engineering degree. Uh, went to work, and, and I always suspected owned part of uh, this company there in West Virginia that did so much work in the mines. Uh, have you ever gone down the highway in the mountains, and you've seen where they've cut the where they've cut the mountain away, and you see those holes here, and about a foot over, you see a hole here, and they were drilling down through there, and then they would put dynamite in them, they would blow them loose, or their machines could come in when they were drilled that close and tear them loose. Well, that's what Carl did, uh, and as far as I know, Carl always supervised, so I know Carl made good money. She, was, she, would, she had been to college, she was a school teacher. Uh, I, I just know they had a lot of money. But I guarantee you, you'd have never known it. You needed something, they'd make sure you had it. Uh, the way they dressed, uh, they could really dress up. I mean, I know she had fancy jewelry. They knew how to behave out in public, but drove a Mercedes. But they weren't the kind of people that just threw that in your face. They were good, nice people. I don't think this is the kind of people he was talking here. He's not condemning all rich people. Some people do that. Uh, they're rich. And, and that's, if it wasn't for the rich people of this world, where would the poor people be? We need to understand that. 
We need to understand that. That's why, that's why you shouldn't overtax the rich people just because they're rich. Where do you think the jobs are coming from? You think the poor people are running the factories out there? No. It's these rich people. Maybe they didn't get it honest, and we need to pray about that. But, but don't condemn all rich people. Now, James is condemning some here. He tells them to weep and howl. Uh, in other words, we can see the point he's making here. He's saying, you're headed for trouble. You are headed for trouble. Go to now or listen to me, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. They are coming. Uh, and when he says miseries, uh, he's saying suffering. He's saying, and another word, another two words here would be great distress. Great distress is coming upon you. I can't imagine what it would be to have been rich, say all your life, or work real hard and got rich, and you didn't depend on God, and God allows everything you have to be taken away from you. Remember the stories they told about the Great Depression, about how the, it was, I think it was probably hyperbole. It was it's just an exaggeration for the sake of emphasis, but it might have happened that the, uh, the skyscrapers in New York City, they said you had to stand in line to jump off the roof. These people had lost everything. These people that had had so much, and then they lost it. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? I mean, you had everything, and it's all gone. What would you do? Jump off a building, I guess. But then how about people like us? And I'm digressing a little bit here again, but, and I'll start with verse 1 next week. But how about people like us? Shouldn't we be praising God that we saw hard times? Uh, we saw our parents take in laundry. We saw our parents dig ditches. Uh, we, we saw, you might have seen a parent worked on the garbage truck. Of course, they tell me now that that is one of the better jobs that you can get working for Rumpke or one of those. And it's, to me, that ought to be a really a good paying job. Nothing, and there's nothing wrong with it. But aren't we better off, those of us that, maybe even some of you today live from paycheck to paycheck. I'm sure some of you do. Are you praising God for it? He says, praise God for all things. Why should you praise God that you just live from paycheck to paycheck and sometimes then you're robbing Peter to pay Paul? Because God is teaching you something that's going to mean something for your salvation and probably for your families also. I know my family always worked. My brothers and I have always worked. Why? Because we learned it from our mom and dad. We learned it if we learned we learned it. <laughs> I've lived in Ohio County for so long I'm talking about them. Oh, I'm I'm gonna be careful. I haven't had supper yet. But she's such a sweetheart, she even asked me what I wanted for supper tonight. She said, you're not getting it, but uh, she did ask me. Uh, now, see, I for, what was I talking about? Sweetheart. Uh, supper. Supper. You're right. It's time to close. Uh, we'll start with verse 1 next time. Father in heaven, Father, we thank you so much. Father, you know, Father, so many people have canceled their Wednesday night Bible study. Father, we know that you don't tell us in your word that we have to have it. But, Father, I'd sure be lost without it. I know a lot of other people, Father, would just, they would just feel incomplete without this. It's good. I wish everybody would go back to it. And, Father, the fellowship is especially sweet. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this time together. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus and for his word.
In Jesus' name, amen.